Welcome everyone. Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, wherever you're joining us from in the world. And welcome to this Australian National Dialogue as part of the United Nations Food System Summit, hosted by the Australian Centre for International Agricultural Research, or ACR, in partnership with our Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. My name is Veronica Dorr. I'm one of ACR's research program managers, and I'll be your host today. Now it's customary in Australia when we have a formal meeting like this to begin with an acknowledgement of country. We're paying our respects to the first peoples of the lands upon which we meet. So I'm speaking to you today from Nunawal country, and I would like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging, extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who may be joining us today, and indeed extend it to all first peoples who may be part of this summit dialogue. We're here today to talk about multi-stakeholder partnerships as a game-changing proposition for transforming food systems. The United Nations Food Systems Summit is organized around proposing these game-changing propositions. And of course, partnerships aren't new. So our proposition is not just that multi-stakeholder partnerships are critical, but we're really interested in exploring what's truly game-changing about managing them really deliberately along the various stages of an innovation pathway. We think there's great promise for that deliberate management as a, as a game-changing solution to address the food systems issues and opportunities that we face globally. Now, let me just share my screen with you because I want to talk to you about the flow of the agenda today. So we begin with just a few talks that are setting the scene, um, that help you understand what it is we're trying to talk about today and how this plays into the Food System Summit. We then have a series of four keynote presentations. These are, these are projects that have utilized multi-stakeholder partnerships to achieve more than they would have otherwise. And, and these are intended to get you thinking about some of the details of how you manage deliberately these multi-stakeholder partnerships across an innovation pathway. They're examples of doing that. We'll then get to the most important part of a dialogue, the actual discussion part, where we'll all break out into, into different small group discussions so that we can talk about your experiences, your successes, the things you think we still need to learn about managing multi-stakeholder global partnerships. So those keynote presentations, you should use them to kind of get your juices flowing. Think about how you want to contribute in that small group discussion. We'll then come back from those breakout rooms and hear some reflections in plenary about what each group discussed. I uh, will conclude with some closing remarks that give you a really good idea of how we're going to feed your ideas and your information into the Food System Summit processes and what the next steps are for your participation and continuing the dialogue that we start today. To get started with the scene setting talks, I'm hoping to successfully hand over first to Sean DeClen from the World Economic Forum who's going to give us a brief introduction to the UN Food System Summit and the value of partnerships. Welcome, Sean. Thank you. Uh, and it's really nice to, to be here today. And so I'm speaking to you from Geneva. Uh, so this is one of the, the virtues of the virtual world uh, that I get to participate in a discussion today like this. Uh, my name's Sean DeClean. I'm on the executive committee of the World Economic Forum, but I have the privilege of chairing the innovation lever for the UN Food System Summit. And uh, the, I mean, the announcement by the Secretary General of a Food System Summit for this year, that is both a people summit and a solution summit to deliver progress against all of the 17 United Nations Sustainable Development Goals has ensured that food systems are squarely in the spotlight of the current agenda. The impact of COVID-19 has also further highlighted the frailties and the, the weaknesses in the food systems globally. 
And so in calling for a solution summit and a people summit, the rise of innovation presents a huge opportunity in enabling the work against the five objectives of the summit around improved access to nutritious food, uh, ar around uh, the consumption of, of food in a way that's more sustainable for the planet, for nature positive food, for food that is more incorporating of the needs of people and of resilience of food systems. So, but in that context, I'd just like to make three observations for you to think about today. The first is that we need to be thinking systemically and that an integrated multi-stakeholder response is going to be required if we're going to transform the food system. There are no silver bullets here. There are no single solutions. There are no one issue or one partnership that is going to, to solve this. What we're facing is a growing web of really complex, challenging and underlying structural risks across the whole food system that's going to require us to focus on scalable, cross-sector, systemic solutions that support change in a way that will improve the food system. But not just one piece of the food system, but the entire food system and how these various pieces come together. And so I suppose that leads me to the second observation, that this is going to require a very different way of working. It's going to require a much more integrated response to food system transformation, building up of multi-stakeholder platforms for, for action, both at the local level, the link in at the national level and the regional level and along global value chains. And so adopting a platform approach beyond just a partnership approach is going to be key. And so thinking about that from that perspective means that there are some principles and some quite simple principles that have to be adopted. That we need to be thinking, as I said, of platforms rather than of institutions. Projects or pilots that our collective energy should go on bolstering and aligning efforts rather than doing our own thing and duplicating efforts that already exist. And probably most importantly, that we break the silos, that we stop thinking about food as food and water as water and climate change as climate change. Uh, but we actually look at how we cut across all the various silos. Grow Asia that we've been working with is a very dynamic example of how this can be done, involving hundreds of value chain partnerships that are interconnected, creating a mobilizing coalitions that support action across different countries in ASEAN and Papua New Guinea, looking at how they can support local country specific objectives, but also cross cutting agendas such as digital solutions or Recently, there's been a, a very strong approach around the Fall Army one, bringing together public and private and different scientific and business and social communities. The third observation that I'd like to make is this is going to require a significant rethink around innovation if we're going to transform food systems and to build inclusive food systems. What we've seen is that Globally, our focus on innovation in food systems has actually been, say, much weaker than the focus on healthcare. Over a similar period over the last decade, there was 145 billion invested into healthcare, whereas there was only about 14 billion invested into food systems innovation, with 18,000 startups in the healthcare side of things when we did our research a year or two ago, as opposed to a thousand in the food system arena. But I think what we're also seeing is that apart from new innovative startups, new innovative ideas and technologies, we're going to need to see an innovation in policy, an innovation in business model design, an innovation in social 
and institutional arrangements if we're going to, to deal with this. We need to be thinking in a comprehensive innovation way if we're going to address the systems nature of this problem. And that's what I'd like to leave you with today is as you think about innovation and technology in these discussions, take a broad view of innovation that includes both the technological, but also the social and the institutional innovations that are gonna be so important to make this work. And then I'll hand back to the organizers and I'm very happy to be part of this dialogue with you today. Thank you so much, Sean. We're very happy to have you. And that was an excellent way to set our minds to the enormous challenge, but also the enormous inspiring opportunity presented by this global set of dialogues organized as part of the UN Food Systems Summit. As another scene setting talk, I'd like to now hand over to Professor Andrew Campbell, who's the CEO of ACR, who's gonna to talk to us a little bit about why Australia and certainly ACR, the hosts today, value a national dialogue that's actually about global partnerships. Over to you, Andrew. Thank you very much, Veronica. Um, greetings, everybody. It's wonderful to see so many uh, ACR partners and friends in innovation in, in the region in particular. And thank you, Sean, for that great introduction. Uh, as Sean said, the food system is is central to meeting so many of the SDGs. We can't meet our, our climate goals, our health goals, our um, gender goals, our water goals, any of those uh, major globally agreed objectives if we don't have uh, sustainable, healthy food systems that are, are produce, making uh, nutritious food accessible in ways that use less land, less water, less nutrients and emit fewer greenhouse gases than we've done in the past. And that's a formidable uh, scientific and technical challenge, but it's also, as Sean said, a formidable challenge uh, for policy, for institutional arrangements, for the finance system, for insurance. There's a whole, so many dimensions of this food system challenge and it's very clear that although there are many, many organisations represented in this virtual room, none of them have the scope to uh, comprehend, to encompass uh, all of the dimensions of that challenge. Um, or if they do, they certainly lack the levers to intervene in the necessary places in the necessary ways. So by definition, almost partnerships are fundamental collaborations and, and particularly novel ones. But I'm gonna get down into the nitty gritty just before we um, break out into the groups. As someone who's been involved in a lot of partnerships, they're actually hard. Uh, they're terrific in theory, um, uh, but it's really important in my view to keep a value proposition in mind that we come together with others to build critical mass to tackle challenges that we couldn't tackle on our own or to do so much more effectively, to make better use of scarce resources and hopefully to be ambitious and to take risks that we wouldn't be able to do on our own. So uh, if a partnership is only proceeding at the speed of the, the slowest partner, then in my view, that's a lost opportunity. The best partnerships go faster than any partner would be comfortable doing on their own. The best partnerships are more ambitious and the best partnerships achieve synergy. In other words, they, they're not just a group of players around a, a table combining effort, but they are able to do things that would simply would not be possible even in aggregate with the others. But they are expensive in transaction costs, in opportunity costs of having your best people tied up always in meetings, even, even a meeting, meetings like this that don't emit uh, uh, greenhouse gases as much. Uh, partnerships dilute your brand. Why should we get involved with all these others? Why can't we just have our logo on everything? Partnerships dilute control. And so there's a whole bunch of costs in inverted commas associated 
with collaborating with others to a shared end. And it's really important that you focus on the benefits side of the partnership to ensure that you actually are capturing synergy, that you are doing things that are more ambitious, uh, at greater scale, uh, that are potentially more risky than, than individual partners would be comfortable with. And as the old saying goes, success has many parents and failure is an orphan. If uh, occasionally you're too ambitious, well, you can just say that those guys made us do it. Um, you know, it wasn't our idea, um, but we've learned lessons. And in my view, the only failed project really is one from which you don't learn any lessons. So if you take that spirit into uh, ambitious collaborations, it's amazing uh, what can be achieved. So uh, Veronica, I, I think I'll leave those introductory remarks there. Uh, ACR is involved in a whole bunch of collaborations at different scales, including, um, including at the international level with the CGIAR, but also uh, in our region with SPC in the Pacific and across Southeast Asia with the PARI. Uh, the um, Asia Pacific Association of Agricultural Research Institutions. So we have a bunch of different platforms at different scales from which to try and incubate innovation, but also then partner with others who are able to take innovation to scale and make a difference on the ground for the benefit of the hundreds of millions of smallholder farmers uh, who play such a huge role in feeding not just their own communities, but uh, the rest of us. And just as a final observation, our analysis of the impact of COVID on food systems across this region suggests that agriculture has played a very important shock absorber role in, uh, uh, and has shown amazing resilience in absorbing significant movements of people uh, in uh, sustaining food supply despite disrupted um, transport networks and so on. And in social protection measures too, in countries that have got some of those measures right. So it's been very fascinating to see the, the seminal role that agriculture has played in responding to COVID across this region. And I think more broadly, and again, I'd like us to think about the partnerships that can learn as much as possible from this incredibly disruptive experience that we're still enduring and to think about how uh, hopefully as we come out of this this uh, pandemic that we we build food systems as part of the building back better agenda which are not just lighter on the planet but much healthier for us in every sense of the word and which manage those systemic risks um, particularly of zoonotic diseases, noting that COVID is the sixth global pandemic, zoonotic pandemic since 1980. This is not a one in a hundred year event. This is something that we're going to see more and more frequently if we don't address systemic risks in food systems and landscape management. So I'm looking forward very much to the dialogue. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. And uh, um, I'm looking forward for inspiration as the evening uh, wears on here in Chile, Canberra. Thank you very much, Andrew. That was that was excellent. Uh, and, and in particular, I'm looking for both inspiration and and some genuine deep discussions. Um, that, that was a perfect scene setting in the sense that what we really want to foster today is a true dialogue about all of the successes, but also all of the difficulties and the, and the challenges associated with partnerships. So I, I have the pleasure of giving the next scene setting talk, and it's a short one, but it's, it's a little bit more um, operational. It's intended to guide all of you in your thinking about how you can participate in the discussion today. So, um, so we heard from Sean a little bit more about the Food Systems Summit itself. And this is just a, a small slide um, to, to make sure that you're aware of the processes going, going forward. So, so the summit is intended to, to, to really awaken us to, to the notion of, of how, the need to and how we can transform uh, the way the world produces, consumes and thinks about food. These dialogues 
are forming part of, of national contributions to the summit. And, and the United Nations will be taking the outcomes of a whole series of dialogues and consolidating them to make progress toward intentions and commitments. So the dialogues are part of this exploration stage of the summit. But indeed, a number of dialogues have already happened and, and, and the consolidation is, is already progressing. So the, the summit is organized around five action tracks which Sean made reference to. But as there's been some early consolidation of outcomes from dialogues, we've started to see action areas be, be developed that are, that are emerging in a ground up, ground up bottom up way from all of these dialogues associated with the action tracks. In addition to those action areas though, with each action track, there have been identified some cross cutting levers of change. One of those is innovation, and Sean made reference to that. He has the, the chance to lead the innovation lever of change. And, and that is exactly where this dialogue fits into the process. So we define innovation actually as a process. So it's not just about the technological or the social uh, 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 you know, changes, outcomes that we're seeking. Innovation is actually also a process of creating and applying knowledge and technology to solve complex problems at scale. It is therefore part of the how transformational change can be created and, and, and an essential complement to the what, the, the specific types of transformational change we might be seeking to achieve. So from our perspective, Multi-stakeholder partnerships are an essential part of that how. They're an essential part of that innovation process, particularly when we want to bring innovations to scale, to, to really roll them out, to benefit large numbers of people, large parts of the globe. Now we propose, we've been doing some, some deep thinking about what is it that, that we think we want to say about multi-stakeholder partnerships. And that's what we really wanna hear from you today. But we want to provide some guidance for how you can think about and contribute to this. So we've, we've thought that there's probably five foundations for successful partnerships. And these are depicted at the bottom of this graphic. So what we're contending today is that Enabling and optimizing partnerships that truly transform food systems requires careful attention to these five foundations. They include how we effectively manage risk in partnerships, how we promote inclusive processes and practices in managing our partnerships, how we integrate systems thinking to make the most of that big scale of change that Sean and Andrew were both talking about. The fourth foundation is how we define impact because many partners coming to partnerships may think about impact differently. And our last foundation is how we strengthen capabilities, how we support and leverage the different capabilities available to us in a partnership to create more than we could on our own. These five foundations, we think probably actually need to be managed a little bit differently during different stages of the innovation pathway. So on the left side of the diagram, you see those stages represented. Now we all know innovation doesn't proceed to scaling in a linear fashion. Uh, but but we've, we've articulated these very high level stages as a way to guide our contributions and our thinking. So broadly, the innovation process involves some degree of problem definition and analysis, some exploration of options, a validation process, uh, proof of concept, testing our ideas. And then when we think we have a really valid option to progress, then the scaling to roll it out to benefit many people, to create really significant outcomes. 
What we're suggesting today is that the ways in which we enable and optimize partnerships in each of these five foundation areas might need to look a little different at each of these stages of the innovation pathway. And we would like to engage you in a genuine dialogue about this. Now, to help you kind of think this through, to give you a little bit of time uh, and, and to seed the conversations, what we're going to do next is share with you four case study presentations, our keynote presentations. So these are intended to help you reflect on that framework we just presented, that framework of five foundations of successful partnerships managed a little bit differently across the different stages of the innovation pathway. Our speakers today will be talking about their own experiences in work that they have done that may be at different stages of that innovation pathway, but they're gonna be speaking about their experiences in, in working with partnerships to achieve what they've done. These presentations are intended to and help you start, start to decide how you want to contribute your own experiences into the small group discussions. So we hope that you find these keynote presentations stimulating. And, and, and what will happen now is I'll, I'll stop sharing my screen. So we, we've got the list of presenters there, but then I'll verbally introduce each of them. So I'll stop sharing and I'll say, for our first presentation, we'd like to welcome to the screen, Dr. Ronaldo Ibora. He is the director of the Philippine Council for Agriculture, Aquatic and Natural Resources Research and Development. In other words, Picard. And he's a member of ACR's Policy Advisory Council. Dr. Ibora will ta be talking to us today about work that they have been doing to, to progress a, a live version of FAO's report on the state of the world's land and water resources. Over to you, Dr. Ibora. And Dr. Ibora, you appear to be on mute. Thank you very much. Uh, let me share my screen. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'll be uh, giving you an overview of the living assessment of the state of the world's land and water resources for food and agriculture for the solo live, and some of the activities being undertaken in the Philippines related to this particular initiative. As you all know, uh, solo live is a partnership at the global and local level. The AO with uh, partners such as Asia, WOCAT, Water Future, Future Earth, Griffith University, among others, is planning to establish a living assessment version of the state of world's land and water resources for food and agriculture. It will be at the global level that would dynamically and systematically record the progress of sustainable management and sound governance of land, soil, and water resources for sustainable food and agricultural system through periodical uh, updating. Solo Live uh, will offer a framework that will help to prioritize responses in managing trade-offs between agricultural production and other ecosystem services, and identify and tap enter and intra-sectoral synergies and co-benefits in a dynamic and complex socio-ecological system. This uh, framework will also serve as a scientifically sound, easy to use and understand foundation for a variety of users, decision makers and their advisors, stakeholders, professionals, academics, and broader public. On this foundation, a plethora of purposes from planning to policy setting and from implementation to monitoring and assessment, capacity building to scenario making will be built. The framework will be designed to work particularly well with approaches involving the dimension of sustainability, integrated resource management, integrated landscape management, agroecology, nexus and ecosystem-based approaches, IWRM and SLM, among others. It will also be of interest to the practitioners in agriculture, thus enabling a systematic understanding of the various elements 
involved in climate change adaptation and mitigation. It uses international standard parameters such as SDG indicators and their variants, as well as other data that are widely available, minimizing the need for additional data collection. Specifically for DOS to Picard, uh, we put priority on SNT innovations on various commodities and disciplines. We believe that soil and water resources are critical resources for improving agricultural productivity. Different technologies were already developed through the Picard funded projects and other agencies funded programs and projects on soil and water resources. The need for assessing the technologies and impacts is very important including the main information generated through the years. And as such, innovation must be explored by using the available data and translating them into practical application using the appropriate tools and techniques. Furthermore, there's a need to see what response has been put in place to sustainably govern and manage these resources for security, so securing adequate and nutritious food for all, support livelihoods, particularly for rural and agriculture dependent communities and maintain ecosystem services at regional, sub-regional and country levels. Picard uh, participated in the 2020 Solau Live held in August 2020, where various R&D projects implemented by different state universities and colleges, government agencies, local government units and technologies generated on soil and water management were presented. Emphasis was also given to the huge information gathered through the years. It can be shared for data management and analysis. Under the Sustainable Land Management Program, Picard has funded and is currently funding several projects on site-specific and crop-specific nutrient management. Basically, these projects determine the optimum and cost-efficient level of nutrient or resources needed for optimum crop growth. The increasing demand for bigger yields and higher environmental protection will put more pressure on the agricultural sector to produce more with less resources. In this context, recent projects are mostly on smart tools and techniques such as sensors, machines, and information technology. These are other examples of Picard funded projects on soil, nutrient and water management involving various crops being implemented by our partner state universities and colleges in the country. On the other hand, uh, Asia has identified the protection of watershed containing sloping lands and subject to increase agricultural intensity as a priority, along with Im improving the livelihoods of smallholder farmers within such watersheds in the Philippines. These projects were implemented by the Bureau of Soils and Water Management or BSWM. Picard has strong ties with BSWM and Asia and is actively involved in the packaging and monitoring of these projects. Picard also has collaboration with Asia on projects that focus on crop specific land or nutrient management. Recently, Picard has co-funded with Asia projects within identified priority areas, like the development of rubber-based cropping system in Southern Philippines. One of the important components of Solo Live is the Comprehensive Framework for Response Assessment, or CFRA. CFRA is a mechanism that allows comparison of technical, institutional, and policy responses or interventions to address global land water and soil degradation in collaboration with FAO. The CFRA aims to offer a standardized methodology for assessing the relative costs, benefits, and effectiveness of different responses. The CFRA will aid in identifying the priority and sequence of responses for investment decisions, and also in scaling up effective responses. In this manner, the CFRA is critical in finding the optimal mix intervention such as technical, policy, and institutional, while uh, considering the biophysical characteristic, governance structure, and other factors. The CFRA will be pilot tested in the Philippines through the collaboration of Picard, BSWM, FAO, Griffith University, and Asia. 
to evaluate the framework's practicality and efficacy in the context of sustainable land, water, and soil management. The study will have the following objectives. One is to test and validate CFRA to evaluate the effectiveness of technical, institutional, and policy responses to land, water, and soil degradation in the Philippines. Second, identify and prioritize the sequence of responses to best address land, water, and soil degradation, achieve development targets, and mitigate and adapt to climate change in a cost-effective manner. And third, contribute to the refinement of the CFRA that would support its utility in other regions as part of the broader solo initiative of FAO. Under the SOLO Live, the Philippines will be one of the case study countries where a customized problem and response assessment framework at national and subnational levels will be tested. It will be focused on soil erosion being one of the most serious forms of land degradation in the country. About 70% of the country's land area has been affected with soil erosion, which greatly affects the population and the environment. Further, the landscape is very sensitive to climate change-related conditions. A standardized methodology is critically important in integrating problem and response assessment. The Tolo Live will offer. It will prioritize action, when and where to invest, and in sustainable landscape management practices that help close gap in on yield, resolve the trade-off with other ecosystem services, and enhance the resilience of land resources and communities that directly depend on them while restoring and avoiding further degradation. The CFRA is envisioned to achieve the following. First is to uh, an easy to use comprehensive response assessment framework to guide sustainable landscape management practices, to resolve trade-offs with other ecosystem services, enhance the resilience of communities that directly depend on them, and restore and avoid further degradation. Second is to improve uh, decision-making for sustainable management of land, water, and soil in the Philippines, including private and public sector investment to address degradation. And third, support SDG implementation in the Philippines with a comprehensive response assessment to land, water, and soil degradation through state-of-the-art knowledge and international collaboration. At this point, I would like to acknowledge the very strong partnership that we have with Asia and the big support that they are supporting in our program. Again, thank you and good afternoon. Thank you very much, Dr. Ibora. That was a great talk, and, and it's really exciting to think of the, the potential to bring so many different R&D activities together, particularly to sequence the many responses that we might need to address these systems challenges. Thank you for stimulating our thinking. Now, our next keynote presentation was intended to be Ms. Tarika Tamari. She's the director of the Coastal Fisheries Division within the Ministry of Fisheries and Marine Resource Development in Kiribati. And she's going, she was going to be speaking to us about scaling of community-based fisheries management. But in a great example of some of the value of partnership, uh, we will instead be having a different presenter. Apparently the weather is truly terrible in Kiribati and she's having difficulty connecting. So her, her presentation will be given instead by Dr. Ora Lee DeLille from the University of Wollongong, who's been a key partner working in Kiribati on the community-based fisheries management. Over to you, Ora Lee. Thank you uh, very much, Veronica. Um, so, yes, on behalf of the Director of Coastal Fisheries in Kiribati, she was able to send me a presentation, so I hope I will make it uh, justice. Um, so, as um, Veronica said, I'm just going to talk about where Kiribati's uh, Ministry of Fisheries is um, in terms of scaling community-based fisheries management. Um, in terms of the Pacific region, uh, Kiribati is one of the countries really in the Pacific region that is implementing community-based fisheries management. 
uh, which led to having a lot of opportunities for partnerships um, around lessons learned from different countries, um, lessons to be shared and contextualized. And this was very important for Kiribati because the project in terms of implementing and institutionalizing community-based fisheries management as an innovation, as the way to do fisheries management, especially of coastal fisheries, really started in 2014 as a pilot phase with five sites um, in uh, two islands, noting that there are 33 islands in the, in the whole of, uh, of Kiribati. The first partnership in terms of starting uh, this innovation of working between communities and government around the sustainable management of coastal fisheries was a partnership with the Ministry of Fisheries, a Pacific Regional Institution, uh, the Pacific Community or SPC, and the Australian government through funding from uh, ACIA. Um, if you recall Veronica's slide, she was showing in terms of innovation for like scaling um, different stages. Kiribati at the moment, when it comes to CBFM, we are really trying to be in the phase of scaling, really. We've done the pro uh, problem definition, trialing the piloting and the validation, but now we are really at the point where we want to test and scale CBFM. The way that we are looking at it is our priorities to move from maybe doing community-based fisheries management with a few sites, with a few pilot sites being localized, to reaching 100% national coverage, at least in terms of knowledge, so that communities know about the options of being part of the solution when it comes to sustainable management. When we think about scaling CBFM, we are not here talking about the technology. Um, it's not a new technology, it's an innovation that is more um, of a concept that's the concept of collective action, for example, the concept of being inclusive when it comes to decision making and management of resources. So it's not uh, the, the diffusion uh, or the nudge, push and pull nudge of uh, having a, a technological innovation. How can we achieve this um, at the moment is what we are looking at. And we think that we can really scale by fostering partnership to really try to create a multiplier effect. That's what we hope. Um, a kind of CBFM movement in Kiribati. Um, so if we look at different scales, we can, at the moment, we are trying to put an emphasis on building local forums, local networks. And for example, in Kiribati, it's been a network of villages. So local villages uh, that might have a lot of experience who might have been pilot sites and um, for the last seven years who have been involved in CBFM, who have learned the pros and cons, have had successes and failures, are guiding, are passing on their knowledge to their neighboring villages at the island level. And so this creates a wall of island supporting approach, villages helping one another, the ones leading what is happening. For example, um, we can support leaders. That's been really important, uh, leader to leader, knowing what their roles are and they support one another. It's also looking at the roles of women, the, the role of youth. And the lessons can be learned and shared between historical CBFM sites that then take the lead at the beginning. Partnership are also at the level of government institution. So I was talking about CBFM at the community level. We can have villages, villages create networks, create forum, but also at the subnational level, which in Kiribati's island, it could be provincial in some countries. Um, it's important to reinforce the role of island institution. They are key players um, in supporting what their villages are doing. It's really for us trying to emphasize the role they have um, to bring villages together. 
And the way they kind of like do that is they use their formal instances that could be elected officials or their informal pathways. So we've been working very closely with women association and with the Council of Elders that are really key decision makers that have the historical knowledge, but also have networks at the island level to support what is being done. Um, by using the formal and informal partnership, we are building a momentum around CBFM at that subnational level. Um, example can be that CBFM is brought at different meetings during agenda at monthly meetings. Um, but so CBFM is seen um, as something that needs to be talked about, reinforced. And they can assist with enforcement, with fundraising and things like that. At the national level, the government has also a role to play in supporting that movement, supporting villages. Um, in Kiribati, one of the key institutions that has been done with different partnership is a community-based resource management task force that comprise many ministry. It's not just community-based fisheries management is seen as a fishery, as a silo. This is the work that fisheries, because it's about fisheries management. The task force has about eight ministries that include the Ministry of Education to reach schools, the Ministry of Health, showing that having better sustainable fisheries management, hopefully, will lead to outcomes uh, with better nutrition. So how can we develop work with the Ministry of Health? Um, this framing we've seen has been very important for other agencies to realize that they can be involved in supporting the, the movement. Um, and so that has been going on since 2017 and we are continuing to support that. The role of the task force is also as key thing to collaborate between ministry and truly strongly try to coordinate different activities and to point out the ministry that are, all have mandate in working in different islands in different uh, communities, how can they all work together and co-finance activities because uh, funds are limited. Um, in terms of the approach at the moment that we're saying, one of the key learnings through, through the work for the past seven years is that it's not just a government approach to scaling. Really, the need now is to do scaling needs of the stakeholders. Emphasis is on CSOs, civil societies, on building uh, the importance of church in the messaging around community base on collective action and local NGOs. So creating those partnership. Um, for us, it's been having women association is becoming one of the key because it's about inclusivity. We recently had a women led event uh, in um, one of our historical sites, women took the lead in inviting their husband as guests and women were emphasizing how they are key partners in making sure that the coastal fisheries are sustainably managed. We also got uh, approached by schools. Principals of schools want to know how they can be involved in terms of fisheries management. They want to know what is happening in their villages to teach the children, but also to make sure that if we want community-based fisheries management as a movement to be sustainable, then the young children right now, by being formed, by understanding why decisions are made this way, will then be supporting uh, and will know their role in uh, once they reach uh, adulthood. We also rely on international partnership. That's for the Pacific region. It's about sharing and learning from our lessons learned in Kiribati, but also hoping to learn from other countries in the Pacific. Um, and this is to be done not just around fisheries managers, but hopefully at the high level government fora, discussion of ministers of fisheries. And at the global scale, Kiribati uh, is proud to be a champion of the new Commonwealth Blue Charter Action Group on Sustainable Coastal Fisheries. That's something that the director was very uh, keen to promote. And that's about not just learning with other countries, uh, 
within the Pacific, but beyond the Pacific. So if other countries are interested and are involved in coastal fisheries, that's other, another platform to share and to innovate together. And also the support of international donors. The, the importance for Kiribati has been to align donors on Kiribati's priorities. So the ministry wants to be the leader, not donors telling them what they should do, but having them following on their priorities. And to do that, they developed their National Coastal Fisheries Roadmap in 2019 that has helped guiding donors in terms of their activities. And hopefully all these partnerships should assist in scaling CBFM in Kiribati. Thank you very much for listening, Korapa. And yes, I'm sorry that the director couldn't make it. Thank you very much, Dr. Dalil. That was fantastic. Uh, it really strikes me that, that community-based fisheries management is a, is a great example of, of partners enabling each other, supporting each other to play the individual roles that they can, but all as part of a network to create much more significant change together. Now, our third presentation, our third keynote presentation is another example of, of partnership in action because it's actually going to be delivered by three presenters in partnership. So we're next going to hear from Dr. Rika Joy Floor from the International Rice Research Institute, Dr. Christopher Moses from Valley Biosciences, and Dr. Allison Watson, the head of the Secretariat for the ASEAN Action Plan on Fall Armyworm Control. And they're going to be speaking to their work with GrowAsia on scaling biocontrol across Southeast Asia. Over to you guys. Excellent. Uh, thank you very much. Is my screen showing okay? Alison, I think it's inverted. Uh, is it? Okay, so let me just do this. Mm, just going to. Much better. Thank you very much. Sorry, is that okay now? Yes. Oh, no, now it's gone back. It's gone back. Okay. No, that's okay. What I'll do is I'm going to stop that. It worked before and now it doesn't want to work. So uh, can you see it now? Okay. We just see you. Okay. Let me do this. Excellent, that should be okay? Yes, that is. Great, okay, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tato katoa. Welcome and thank you very much. Uh, today, we wanted to give you some insight into how a multi-stakeholder partnership is crucial to achieve the scaling up of biocontrol across Southeast Asia. And firstly, some context, however. The biocontrol program I'm referring to today is part of the wider ASEAN Action Plan on Fall Army Worm Control and Integrated Pest Management. The action plan was signed off by ministers of agriculture across the 10 countries of ASEAN in October 2020 in response to the arrival of the invasive alien species fall armyworm. The action plan has a strong focus on building capability and scaling solutions on integrated pest management across Southeast Asia. ASEAN ministers championed a regional strategy because this fast moving transboundary pest respects no borders. As such, if action isn't successful in one country, then it weakens everyone's response. Fall army worm damage can also be severe and incur a significant financial loss to the region. And farmers are in need of uh, an urgent need of effective, locally valid and regionally relevant management solutions. A coordinated response recognizes that stakeholders across the agricultural sector need to work more effectively together to develop and scale up solutions to manage fall armyworm. There is a need for effective, accessible, affordable and safe alternatives to pesticides that can be adopted at scale by farmers across the region. The development of a biocontrol program also builds on huge interest across the region in biocontrol solutions. For example, over 4,000 people registered for our latest biocontrol workshop and webinar series. 
I'm now going to, uh, oh, but to be successful, the program does need the involvement of stakeholders from across the system to enable innovation and empower farmers with appropriate biocontrol technologies and approaches. I'm now going to hand over to Dr. Rika Joy Floor from IRI, followed by Dr. Chris Moses from Valent Biosciences to explain more about those barriers to biocontrol currently faced in the region and why there is a need for partnership approaches to address these. Rika? Thanks and good day. Next slide, please. The low uptake of biocontrol is not only because the issues are concerning farmers, such as low level of knowledge or user preferences. There are interrelated problems, such as the existing technologies that are still immature, um, the policy context, and the industry around biocontrol and this is with respect to a more established industry around pesticides. Next slide, please. What then is needed across the different stakeholder groups? And I will work through a couple of, of stakeholders that are important here. On the next slide, we're looking at what then is needed at the farmer level. To improve uptake, farmers need to be able to early on identify that the problem will happen and what the problem would be and they need monitoring and early warning systems but the farmers more than that also need to have value around um, existing biodiversity and how they can harness that biodiversity not only for their production systems for yield but also for uh, other um, services that it can provide the farmers indeed need knowledge but they also need to develop the skills to use biological control and align their agronomic practices to fit with biological control. Now, in terms of, of the farmers having access to products, it could be commercially available and that's limited in many countries, but they could also access products from other ways, such as the government or other groups that could produce this. But what they need is to be able to establish that there is economic benefit for using that product over the product that they uh, currently use. Lastly, it is also important for the farmers to be able to access a service or to have a service industry around the, the biological control. For example, people who have equipment and will be able to provide the service to farmers to apply biocontrol in their fields. And that helps to ease the access um, to the technology. Next slide, please. From research side, there are also several things that is necessary. At this point in many countries, there's still a need to identify what are the biocontrol options that exist and to test these options and look more uh, specifically in terms of their efficacy and understanding what does that mean for the economics of farmers. And then to also further define how this should be used, when is it better to use it. Also, this research could provide an idea of what is the impact of biocontrol and then what are the, also the potential risks. And these have to be communicated well to the other stakeholders to um, improve the, the narrative and, and the level of knowledge around biological control. We've also seen that early warning and decision support systems are needed to build um, uh, a system that farmers would be able to um, gain the knowledge and sufficiently address uh, on time the pests. And lastly, from research, it's also important to strengthen the innovation system for biocontrol. And what this means is, for example, complementing biocontrol with other sustainable technologies, such as host plant resistance, for example. It could also be building the capacity for mass production and release of biological control to enable the system to see what it means at the landscape scale or at the bigger scale for the farmers, not just at an individual plot. And lastly, the research also needs to communicate to the key stakeholders, uh, particularly policymakers and also the service sector to build interest around this technology. Next slide, please. From the policymakers, this is very important. What we've learned over time uh, working with policymakers is that they need some time to understand what is exactly this biocontrol option. What risk does it pose for the community or for the country? 
and they need to build systems to test the quality and regulate biocontrol. If biocontrol is tested as a pesticide or as a fertilizer, it does not do much service for the technology itself. So they need to develop a separate system to regulate that. And there's also a need for uh, supporting policies for biocontrol, locally manufacturing that, or for those that are importing to be able to register the products and to be able to trade the products in the country. And as Alison mentioned, this is transboundary pest. So it is also important for policymakers to enable uh, coordination and to harmonize what are the policies uh, across the region and be able to allow for sharing of, of solutions and of knowledge across the region. With that said, I hand over to Dr. Chris Moses. Yeah, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes. Uh, yeah, the title of my presentation is uh, Biopesticides, Barriers to Adoption, uh, uh, the Industry Perspective. Next slide, please. Okay, there are major constraints and all the major constraints are grouped into four categories. The first, they are perceived like chemical pesticides. And the number two is often promoted as a silobulet. And number three is farmers fail to recognize the snake oil products against the legitimate uh, products. And the last one is regulatory hurdles or lack of uh, quality control for some of the biopesticides. Next slide, please. Okay. I'll go through a little more details. And coming to the perception of the biopesticides, uh, often pesticide distributors can influence the farmer's mind either positively and negatively. That will be a challenge. And farmers are accustomed to affordable, affordable chemical pesticides. And for them, the mindset is already tuned. And some of those acceptance barriers are, they are not as effective as chemical pesticides and the, the higher cost and slow in action, you know, these are the major, uh, the acceptance barrier. And lastly, uh, the risk covers customers and generally they prefer to continue with the old habits. And coming to the second major pillar, what is the biopesticide are not uh, panacea. Biopesticides are not chemicals and ideally they should be promoted only where it is needed. And the major focus could be for the resistance management, the residue management, as well as for organic farming. Ideally, they could be uh, used in the early season when the pest pressure is low or use them in the late season to prevent uh, the residues in the harvest. And lastly, they could be used in rotation or alternation with the chemicals and also as a tank mix uh, partners. Next one, please. Next slide, please. It might just take a little while to come through. Has it come through on your end? Uh, yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, the snake oil products, uh, Unregistered snake oil products hurt the legitimacy of the time-tested uh, biopesticides and the standard biopesticides also. And again, the poor efficacy, efficiency in the field dampened the farmer's interest and the, the opinion of the biopesticide changes, you know, generally. And secondly, some of the countries in a desire to promote biopesticides and also encourage uh, the small and medium enterprises fail to check the rampant growth of the snake oil products. And lastly, Therefore, uh, we, we strongly advocate that there should be a strong QC mechanism for uh, every product. Uh, the last major pillar is the regulatory harmonization. Each country in the region has a different guidelines for registration of biopesticides and the harmonization will definitely help for uh, faster reach. And the data also should be acceptable across the countries in the region. And uh, there is, an attempt to fix MRL for biopesticide, for example, Bacillus uh, thuringiensis based product, and there is a there is a discussion on the MRL fixation. But then, when there is a zero day PHI, there should not be any concern for MRL. That also should be uh, taken note of it. And lastly, and the toxicological requirement for the biopesticide should be either uh, uh, 
minimized or should be avoided. And that, that, that's the reason we feel that the multi-stakeholder approach comprising of the, the policy makers, the, the producers and the farmers will definitely help in taking us in a long way. Thanks a lot. So the aim now is to bring stakeholders together in the region to improve the capability, capacity and use of biocontrol across Southeast Asia. Our focus areas will be to grow the knowledge and research base for this region, look at ways to enhance the regulatory environment and understand any barriers to biocontrol use, as well as to implement pilots and demonstration projects to show the efficacy of different options. We're also really keen to build a virtual ASEAN Biocontrol Research and Innovation Hub, which we would welcome any interest from the audience today to be a part of. I highlight the earwigs on this page because they represent the different Southeast Asian research groups working on earwigs and fall armyworms specifically who are not aware of each other's work. And I think just fostering future networking, sharing of information and support in itself across research teams and multi-stakeholder partnerships, this is a small example of the power of partnerships and scaling up research and innovation efforts at greater scale. Now I just wanted to end and I'm not going to go into detail on this slide, but I wanted to leave you with a selection of success factors that are some of the hallmarks of successful management of multi-stakeholder partnerships and some of the real common problems we encounter in this partnership work. They're not in any particular order, but resourcing is always an easy factor to begin with. It's very difficult and time consuming often to get funding and funding is indeed needed if we want to do this work with multiple partners and at this scale. Time and timing also need to be considered. Systems change takes time and lead in times and development phases are always underestimated. Building trust is essential as a multi-stakeholder work can be new and confronting for some stakeholders and not everyone welcomes change to the way we always do it. It can also be confronting for many. Yet like the full army worm, these challenges in the multi-stakeholder environment can be tackled with creative and flexible solutions and with an integrative and pragmatic mindset. And this is essential if we're to shift towards more sustainable food systems in the future, and indeed to increase the uptake of biocontrol across Southeast Asia. I'd like to thank both uh, Rika and Chris for joining me today, and I wish you well in your discussions later today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Doctors Watson, Flora, Moses. Uh, so to me, that was a great example of reminding us that that different stakeholders and different members of a partnership have different needs, and 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 it really is by satisfying those multiple needs together that you can create significant change. Our final keynote presentation is coming to us from Dr. Richard Sturziker from CSIRO, Australia's National Science Organization, and Dr. Petra Schmitter from the World Bank. And they're going to be talking to us about developing the Virtual Irrigation Academy as a part of the process of scaling the Chameleon Soil Moisture Sensor. Over to you. Well, thank you, Veronica. Um, yes, the context for our case study is uh, smallholder irrigation. Uh, we're going to focus on Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and I'm going to give an overview and then hand over to Petra, as you said, at the five minute mark. Um, I'll borrow a line from Andrew to start with and say that ACR has been a long-term partner, and I can say they have helped us to think bigger and move faster. Uh, Petra, can you share your sli slides? We only have two, so if it looks busy, there's only one more. And before I start, I want to tell you three big things about smallholder irrigation. And the first big thing is it can make a big difference to food security and livelihoods, especially when you've got a long dry season to get through. The second big thing is uh, that there's big money lined up to build irrigation infrastructure. If you're used to research project budgets, wow, you should see these development project budgets. And the third big thing is that irrigation can be a big disappointment because if you don't get high yields, you can't pay for the governance component, the operation and the maintenance, and that these schemes can slowly uh, break down, the infrastructure can degrade, they fall into conflict. Right, well, if you wanna scale something, you need an innovation and ours, as Veronica said, is uh, contained in the Virtual Irrigation Academy, the VIA, you see that's chameleon down on the bottom right hand corner 
And the two innovations or the, or the several innovations here at the top circle, you can see some sensors that we've built that are connected to a reader that sends data to a, a mobile phone. And if you look at the bottom circle, you see um, something called a wetting front detector that takes a water sample. Uh, and from that, we measure nutrients and salts. So what's interesting about these tools is that they, they all give their output as color and the colors have meaning and are linked to action. So when you take a lot of readings, you end up with color patterns. Now, color is a universal language, and uh, that means that everybody can participate and understand what it all means, uh, and they do. So let's talk about scale. Um, scale in that, uh, well, I've got it circled above. Uh, you can think of it in two ways. There's a hierarchical element to it. Uh, uh, we work with farmers on farms. Um, but many of these farms are, are, are brought together on schemes with shared infrastructure. And if we go a level above that, um, most of these countries have a national irrigation investment framework uh, with 10 or 20 year plans. Now we work at all these levels. So what sort of impact metrics are we looking at? Well, for farms, it's obviously gross margins. Um, at schemes, we look at the value of water, uh, and we do that by looking at um, what is the total value of goods, of food that's left the scheme, and we subtract the cost of producing all the food and the costs of the monitoring tools, and we divide that by the amount of water, and you find out what water is worth to you. Uh, the metric for at a national scale is the internal economic rate of return. That's looking back over 30 years of the scheme. What did the scheme actually do? generate. Now I've just put some indicative numbers there, the before and after in, in, in red and green. Uh, they are real actually, but they're real for one scheme, which I happen to have picked. We work at many, many, many schemes. Um, and you can see that it can make a big difference to farmers at farm scale with gross margins going up enormously. Um, you can see at scheme scale, if we look at the purple line, that the value of your natural resource, the value of your water can go up enormously as well. And well, the internal economic rate of return, this bottom line here, uh, if, if it's minus 3%, it means the country loses money by investing in irrigation. And let me tell you that money is not lost by the people who build the scheme, it's lost by the people who live on that scheme and who have to try to to um, maintain it and operate it, that's the farmers. So let's look at these numbers and say, well, how do we scale? Well, it's, everyone thinks it's very obvious. Uh, if people are making money, all you need is a shop, just buy the stuff. Well, there's many reasons why farmers won't. Uh, many of them don't actually have a hectare irrigated, so that number has to get divided in two or three, that gross margin value. Uh, farmers don't want assets on their land, things that can get stolen or vandalized. And what's more, having information on my farm, knowing I'm red, red, red on a chameleon, that means you're dry. Well, if my water user association is corrupt, it doesn't help having information, I won't get any water. Well, let's jump to the other side. Uh, let's look at uh, a 17% um, uh, return on investment of a $2 billion uh, plan, which is one of the countries we're working with, that, that's a lot of money. And you wouldn't even notice it if you started uh, uh, sending all this gear to all the farmers in your country. But you can't do water management in a compliance way. You can't drop it in from above. It just doesn't work. And then we get to this middle one, uh, the value of water going up, well, in this case, 36 times. The people who generated that value can't capture it. Uh, that water is then used by others or goes back to the environment. But uh, here we have, again, the problem of a shared resource. Okay, partners, we've worked with all these people, farmers, private sector, water use associations, all the way to government. And we have scaled, we've scaled chaotically from tens to hundreds to thousands but how do you go to millions? And that's where Petra comes in. Thank you, Richard. So when we think about scaling, we often get into this trajectory as Richard just mentioned, you know, this works. How do we get it multiplied everywhere? And we just talked about how we went from farmers to schemes to, to national level. 
Uh, but we also heard from the earlier speakers how complex the food system is, how many actors and institutions that are involved and actually form very complex networks. Um, which are influenced by socioeconomic, ecological and political contexts. We also just heard about the win-win partnerships it requires and the fact that alone you can't achieve as much as, as you could do it together. So if there's something that we learned in our partnership with Richard and the VIA platform is that also our actions um, and partners really has evolved over time and that we really didn't follow one scaling pathway, but we explored several ones uh, in different countries um, adhering to the different contexts that we were situated in. Our journey goes back uh, to 2014 in Ethiopia when I gave Richard the first call um, asking for some gear urgently to figure out what made farmers uh, improve water management and agriculture. And we did that in different schemes, but also we looked at other type of irrigation settings where farmers used pumps, uh, grew either staples or high value crops. And whereas the results differed among all these different typologies of irrigation, we did see that the tools enabled farmers to make better decisions. Um, and that though the first um, decision wasn't to reduce water, but to improve yields, income, uh, reduce labor, et cetera, the effects were quite similar. So we then uh, looked at how can we multiply these? How can we export these to, to more farmers in the same scheme, um, travel to, to different countries? So we started um, putting in different uh, proposals, different projects, and also started to expand our partnerships. Not only did we work with farmers and local research institutions, we started more and more working with extension offices, um, national governments. And we started talking also to the private sector to really look at how can we co-invest, um, what type of investments are needed, but also, and this is where um, the next step of scaling comes in the accelerate, what is actually the main bottlenecks in the enabling environment? Um, what are some of these changes in, in the policy that really could enable these technologies to, to, to scale? So this is actually where we are now at the moment. We are looking at the supportive technical and, and financial environment um, because farmers who grow or irrigate a crop in an irrigation scheme likely have different opportunities, but also different needs compared to those in um, individual irrigation systems. And this links us back to then the niche step again. You know, what are your different type of partnerships that you need to go to the next level? So we don't see each of these scaling components as independent, nor as a logical consecutive manner. So for us, in order to transform really our food systems, we require different partnerships at different times and really do uh, need to acknowledge that it's not a silver bullet. Um, it requires multi-stakeholder dialogues, but also, again, the partners need to be inclusive and need to be acknowledged of, of risk sharing and finding um, the opportunity to co-invest, but also co-learn co along the way. Over to you, Veronica. Thank you very much, Richard and Petra. A great example of the fact that partnerships do need to change over time along the innovation pathway and, and a great introduction to the conversations where we really want to focus on, on things like if we do that more deliberately, uh, what does that look like and how does that give us greater benefit? So I'm very conscious of time and that I need to be moving everyone um, into conversations as quickly as possible. So let me just give you a little bit more guidance about the conversations that, uh, that we'd like to encourage you to have. Uh, so, so first of all, let's remember the principles of engagement here. So you would have noticed that we were, we were recording um, these, these provocative presentations, these presentations that are designed to help you get, get thinking. Um, but we will not be recording the breakout rooms uh, because we really want to encourage encourage Chatham House rules. We really want to encourage a genuine dialogue here that's open, honest, um, full of talk about the problems as, as well as the best practice approaches that, that you think you've experienced. We will have note takers in each of the rooms, just so you are aware, but, but their intention is, is simply to help us with the synthesis, and we certainly won't be making any individual attributions. 
So be courageous and bold. We encourage diverse views to be shared, um, to be discussed. And, and if possible, if your bandwidth allows, please keep your video on because we all know you can have richer conversations that way. But there are other ways to participate. So if there isn't video or even audio, you can use the chat functions in the rooms as well. So as part of the food system summit processes, each game changing proposition kind of begins with a, a future statement, a goal statement, a vision statement. And, and what we're putting forth here for the moment is that 2030, we're interested in seeing that global stakeholders are working together in optimized partnerships that support the process of food systems innovation, developing those food system solutions and scaling them for impact. And what we really want to have a dialogue about today is what does optimized mean? What are optimized partnerships? How do you need to manage them differently across those different stages of the innovation pathway? So there's some prompting questions that the facilitators in your breakout rooms may use. Um, but overall, we're really asking you to reflect on your own experiences in a, in a concrete and tangible way and, and talk about uh, where, where, where you've experienced or where you've seen best practice so that we can really try to understand what is so game changing about multi-stakeholder partnerships managed in a more deliberate way and where, where there's still real opportunities for us to learn um, because it's not quite working as well as it needs to. So each breakout room will focus on a different foundation for successful partnerships. So we've got five of those foundations, just to remind you, and, and the room that you're in, your, your facilitator will introduce which of the foundations we intend to start the conversation with. We don't want this to be too constraining, but we think that there's richness in, in discussing one foundation and, and what it looks like to enable and optimize that across the different stages of the innovation pathway. Now, just so you know, you'll have um, a, a, about 35, 40 minutes or so um, in your breakout rooms. So we encourage you to, to kind of get, get started in the conversation as quickly as possible so we can make the most of them. And then we'll, we'll come back into plenary to share, each of your facilitators will share very briefly some high level uh, insights from, from the discussions that you've had. So I think that's really enough introduction for me because we want to get you into the rooms. Uh, so I believe that happens fairly magically now. Uh, so, so let the, the magic breakout room process begin. Welcome back, everyone. I know that wasn't nearly enough time for a really rich conversation, but hopefully we've gotten things started uh, and, and you were able to kind of throw out some, some great ideas and, and, and hopefully wrestle them around a little bit uh, so that we get some, some rich thoughts coming out of the process. What I'm going to do now, so we, we've come back a little bit later than we originally planned, um, simply because we were running a bit late and well, the most important thing about a dialogue is the actual dialogue part. So I wanted to make sure you, you had enough time to, to at least have some conversations in those rooms. What this does mean is that our facilitators are under some pressure to deliver a really short summary not of everything that was talked about in the room, but just a couple of key messages uh, because there will be more written material that will come out after this. So just a couple of key messages that you, you think are worth delivering to the whole group. I'll call on each facilitator one at a time um, to spend one, no more than two minutes delivering those, those key high level messages um, before we close things out. So we'll go in, in order from left to right <laughs> diagram of the five foundations of successful partnerships. And some of these had two rooms discussing them and some only had one. So we'll begin with the risk theme or the risk uh, foundation of risk management. Uh, and we'll go to Reggie. Reggie, would you like to share what your room discussed? 
Thank you, Veronica. And I've, we've had such a lovely discussion in our room on risk. So let me just share two takeaways. The first one, we talked about the risk of the partnering process itself, right? How do you get to ensure you have the right people and not the wrong people in the room? How do you set the role definitions straight? But most importantly, I think the key suggestions include like uh, skill building for the people, gave, giving them the support, um, such as using integrators or brokers and better communication within the partnership. The second takeaway I felt was what I'm calling a translation risk. How do you take the research outputs uh, and turn that into impact uh, on the field on a longer term basis? And I think we noticed that, yes, there is this tendency of short term perspectives, like the research process can be too short. The funding, let's say, cannot extend it into into like beyond the, the research itself. So some suggestions, of course, is to use other partners. Uh, use a stage approach to ensure the funding uh, can be for the actual implementation and then more uh, support on fostering that innovation to be adopted by other partners as well. So I'll stop there. Thank you, Veronica. And thank you, Group One. Thank you very much. That sounds like you had a very lively discussion. I look forward to seeing the notes from that one. Uh, we will continue to talk about managing risk in partnerships. And Richard, can you tell us what your breakout room discussed? Yes, thanks, Veronica. Am I hearable? Yep, audible, whatever the word is. Okay, our, our discussion actually started with a comment that um, a lot of innovation is actually taking place by farmers on their own, and a lot's taking place in the private sector. And uh, they don't have necessarily an incentive to partner. Um, they've taken a big risk and they want to get something out of it. Uh, and that kind of led us on to a discussion about almost the, you know, those of us who, who, who sit on the, on, the, on the public sector, which is most of us, and, and the few that sit in the private sector. And, um, and I think our conversation harked back again, I think, to many things that Andrew covered, which is that, you know, a partnership is just not about having one of these and one of those. It's not making a cake kind of thing. Um, it's really about, you know, what risk are you prepared to carry and what reward as well? Um, and, um, you know, we did have some discussion at the end about, you know, um, in the face of the sorts of problems we're dealing with, you know, are we in danger, at least on the public side of just getting far too risk averse? <laughs> that's a that's a that's a great spot to end it. Are we in danger of getting far too risk averse? <laughs> Let's that that's a that's a big question to throw at us, uh, Richard. But um, but a good one actually. Um, so so that's that's wonderful to hear, and I and I really like the 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 thinking about who has the who has the the incentives, who gains the value from the partnerships. Um, that's an important way to way to way to think about things, which actually leads very much into the next foundation, which is about inclusivity. Uh, so let's hear from Dulce and what, what Dulce's breakout room talked about. Thanks, Veronica. I'm really under big pressure because there was a lot and we didn't really finish our discussions. But okay, um, for the first question, the biggest takeaway is that um, the practices and the policies that we have on inclusivity have been really good and strong when it comes to the stages of um, problem identification and um, looking at the options and even validation. We agree that the challenge that um, we face is when we do scale out, when we've reached that scaling out phase, and that's when um, it seems inclusivity tapers off. And um, what we're all saying is that, well, we recognize it's critical, it's fundamental across all stages, and yet it's at, that, uh, at the very last stage where inclusivity is often um, you know, problematic. Now, when we talk about, um, well, okay, what, what are the actions and what, what can we do? Um, there are a lot of good suggestions that range from um, engaging, um, you know, broadening the sectors, um, being mindful of um, the language and the communication tools that we use, um, 
ensuring that we're looking at the, uh, uh, really at the broader system, at the, uh, at the entire value chain. Um, but um, there were two specific um, examples that I, I'd like to share. Um, and this came out of um, um, the recognition that, well, we probably need to make sure that um, um, availability and, and accessibility of innovations are available, you know, are, are, are for all. Um, it's for the farmers, it's for those who cannot up, um, afford it, and, and, and for, the, um, for all the mar marginalized sectors. Then um, the other suggestion is, as we go through the different steps of um, the innovations, uh, you know, phases, maybe there's a deliberate stop and break where we do some sort of reflection. Like, okay, we've done problem analysis. Um, have we been inclusive enough? Okay, we've done um, um, options and validations. Have, been, have we been inclusive enough? How can we further improve inclusivity? And again, when we reach the final stage of scaling where we, we were saying it's problematic, let's make that final reflection and, and look at, okay, in what way we can actually um, strengthen inclusivity further. So that's um, from group two. Thank you, Dulce. I had the privilege of being part of that group and, and I think you did a, an excellent job um, giving, giving a, of a, a taste of, of everything we discussed. That's fantastic. We now on, move on to considering the third foundation of successful partnerships, how we really bring in systems thinking. So Petra, would you like to share what your breakout room discussed? Thank you. And equally as with the other groups, we had quite a lively discussion and touched upon many points. Uh, a few takeaways from our side. Uh, which was really about the value addition each partnership brings. So when we think about systems change, it's really about identifying the different partners, the role they play, but also the value that they obtain from being in this partnership. And that the partnership needs to be equal and genuine and not just bring them on board because one person decided that all of a sudden they needed, you know, a person X to be able to get funding or something of that sort. Um, it's also crucial to have uh, certain people really fulfill the their role as a specialist, you know, being really able to deep dive into their role, their activity, but then also have the knowledge brokers, the ones that are able to talk in different languages, understand the different sectors and be able to communicate and build those bridges in order to create a systems change. A last point was also about being considerate about the resources and the time it takes to build partnerships, that those changes don't happen over time and that we can't expect everybody to play their role and be on board uh, from the onset. So as we are setting out to drive systems change, really build in those, those timely processes and the resources. And then last but not least, as we talk about knowledge, um, it's about also understanding the politics, the politics that, that actually drive the policy, that drive the funding, uh, and therefore sometimes reinforces the, the, the single sector siloed approach. So how can we re-divert that? How can we actually build capacity knowledge to again, be the knowledge broker, but also to use funding in order to bridge those divides uh, more systematically. Thank you. Thank you very much. That sounds like it was a lively discussion. Uh, so we'll hear a little bit more now about uh, incorporating systems thinking. We had one more room talking about that. And Beth, uh, what did your room really focus on in discussion? Thanks very much, Veronica. And like every other group, we had a great discussion in group seven um, with um, really a, a lot of very high value points put forward. I think the starting one um, was a little bit of disquiet with the diagram, um, which sort of implies we're on an uphill journey. Um, but in fact, our group noted that as we've moved from um, tighter definition of systems analysis to systems thinking, we've shifted from solving technical problems to um, an iterative sort of problem to solution and, and back again process. And we need to um, bear in mind that it is a dynamic process, that improvement in this, the, the big problems we're working on is likely to be iterative. And 
that we have to find ways to encourage all parts of the system to participate. Uh, at different scales, we need different partners. We need to recognise that. But um, in taking on the different partners that are implied as you scale up, we need to bear in mind the reality of trade-offs and the cost of bad advice or of um, a shift in focus away from the smaller players in the system uh, whose poverty and whose lack of resources um, really mean that, that we need to be careful we're just not imposing solutions that can't deliver value. Um, then as our discussion went on, I think we came up with um, a really interesting discussion about what is an innovation um, and where does it start? And as we move away from a focus on, a, on technical innovation, we thought about established technology in new locations, about um, innovation that was community or collectively driven, not technically driven, and that, that um, tended to bring new actors and new supporters in. But the final point that I think um, was made very strongly by a number of our participants was that in thinking about um, what would actually make a difference in the next three years, we recognised a loss of investment and a loss of donor focus on reflection and recording of what really works. So um, learning is actually um, perhaps not being as emphasised as it was in the past, as we put a strong emphasis on impact, uh, we've perhaps lessened the emphasis on learning. And that's a critical step in making sure that we can actually deliver solutions. Thanks. Lovely. Uh, lear learning is, is, is near and dear to my heart in, in all of this. So uh, fantastic to see that coming out of this conversation. Uh, we'll move to the, and by the way, we fully acknowledge that, that it isn't a linear process. Uh, so, so recognize that there are loops and spirals and, 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 and those complicated diagram, that's all. <laughs> um, so we next move to the fourth foundation of successful partnerships that we were hoping all of you guys would discuss, which is defining impact. Um, so I'll throw to Peter. Peter, can you share what your room discussed? Yeah, thanks. Uh, like the other groups, we had a very lively discussion. Uh, for the first question on the role that how we define impact plays in partnerships, um, we really had two takeaway messages from a lot of discussion. The first was a unanimous agreement that we absolutely must define anticipated impacts at the start in multidimensional partnerships. It's, it's a truism, but increasingly important as we have different countries defining different anticipated impacts in different ways, different donors having different impact expectations and different timeline expectations. And if we're working at different scales, obviously, as we increasingly are when we're talking about climate change and landscape management, impacts vary markedly from local to regional to national. So it's a truism, it's essential, but we wanted to emphasize that. So in short, we all make assumptions that can be very wrong in multidimensional and cross-cultural partnerships. Taking the time to test perceptions we individually have about the impacts we want from the partnerships at the start, lays a solid foundation of trust and understanding those partnerships. That's the first message. The second was we've got to recognise that if we look backwards, the most impressive impacts of multi-stakeholder collaboration are often anticipated, unanticipated at the start. We need to acknowledge that. We need processes that both encourage those unanticipated outcomes and capture them. Those are the two messages for the first question. Four quick takeaway messages from the second about actions over the next three years. Um, we think we, can, we need to provide clearer understanding of the essential role that boundary players can play in bringing together multi-stakeholder partnerships. The second was, um, we've got to be careful that we don't define impacts in food systems strictly around the food systems themselves, around availability to access quality consumption but we've got to be mindful of food and energy linkages. We've got to be mindful of the impacts we're looking for outside the normal boundaries of what we might've been looking at. So improved energy efficiency and production of food. And that particularly you know, aligns with the importance of cities and the growing populations around cities and the need for a focus on a broader range of impacts that we have to manage in these complex ecosystems. Um, a third point was, as we all get more familiar with the world, what a world will look like living 
with COVID-19, we perversely have an opportunity over the next three years to recalibrate partnerships in a focused way around new definitions of what we can achieve together with the new vision of what the world is looking like as we move out of this. And I guess it's a recognition also that somewhat perversely COVID-19 has shown that if the world is threatened badly enough, we can move together and come up with some significant solutions. And the last point really that I, I took the liberty of extracting from a long list of notes is that the future truly needs transdisciplinary approaches within systems. We're not necessarily good at this. Um, the Kiribati example emphasized how this important this is. So we have the opportunity to embark on a long-term cultural transition into that systems and transdisciplinary approaches that the future is going to need. That's it from our group. Thanks, Veronica. Thank you, Peter, fantastic. We had a second room discussing defining impact. So Fiona, can you share what your breakout room discussed? Uh, yes, thank you very much. And thanks to uh, all in room eight, as the others uh, have done. We also had a rich and interesting discussion and um, very similar to the point that uh, Peter started off with, uh, we talked about the importance of understanding right at the outset who was to be impacted, how to measure and report on those impacts, how to make the impacts visible. Um, we then had a, quite a free-ranging discussion on around the different um, uh, partners that are involved. Um, we reflected on, on the government, uh, the importance of alignment with government policy, with getting that local government buy-in, um, and the importance of having a strong understanding of the, the institutional context in which governments operate. Um, governments themselves are, are, are very are changing, uh, their capability is changing, and so we need to be uh, aware of that and to go with it. We reflected on, uh, on the private sector, that, that may, they may not always want to share the limelight, when it comes to uh, in, in, within a partnership, um, but they are um, always interested in a level playing field. So bearing that in mind, we also reflected on, on communities um, and the importance of building trust when you have, uh, as you must, uh, the community as a partner, to have them in a truly consultate, consultative way. That means understanding the culture, understanding the goals and aspirations. Um, and the final point I've made is that that any partnership, and I've, I've just outlined some of the partners, but it actually needs some glue to make the partnership work. So we need to explicitly invest in making partnerships work, in linking the parts, um, because we'll, they, they just won't happen by themselves. Um, now, that's only a small amount, uh, a subset of what we talked about, because we did range far and wide. But um, I think Sarah took great notes, so we can contribute those. Thanks. Thank you. And we definitely will be getting much richer information from the notes for all of the breakout rooms. We have one more breakout room to hear from, uh, the one that was talking about strengthening capabilities. Tristan, can you share what your room discussed? Thanks, Veronica, and, and thanks, everyone. Look, like the others, we had a fantastic uh, fantastic discussion, very rich, lots of excellent examples. Uh, a few takeaway messages. I won't, uh, I won't uh, outline everything that was said. Um, we, we talked about the importance of recognising that, uh, that, that when we, we come together in multi-stakeholder partnerships, we all come from different silos, we all speak different languages, often quite technical languages, uh, and that it's really important to, to recognise that explicitly and to, to generate a, a, a sense of common vision and common understanding of what the, the intention of the group is and what the objectives of that multi-stakeholder partnership are. There was a discussion around the fact that uh, context is, is important and, and understanding the fact that people's subjective uh, understanding of things is very context and culturally dependent and it's important to listen um, and to take the time to really get to know our, 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 our stakeholders, to get to know our partners um, and not to assume that we understand their perspectives but to listen to their perspectives. We then actually engaged in quite a long and rich discussion about power and about the fact that um, that there are power relations within any multi-stakeholder multi partnership that, that we need to very clearly acknowledge and be very explicit about. Because if the, the aim of a multi-stakeholder partnership is actually empowerment, it's empowerment of all parts of that partnership. And we can't empower everyone unless we share power. So it's about understanding where the power resides, 
who 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 owns that power and how they can share it and sometimes i have to be honest as donors and as uh, technocrats we aren't very good at sharing power we like to keep the power and if we want to scale out these innovations and we want to scale out these these benefits we need to empower people all the way down or across that multi-stakeholder partnership to feel that they own the objective and they can make decisions for themselves and take that forward in their own context and we won't we won't succeed unless unless we we confront the issue of power we then had a really rich discussion around the importance of learning by doing and the fact that capability is most efficiently and effectively strengthened when people actually engage in practical action. Uh, and there were some really rich examples around that and around platforms that exist that, do, that, that facilitate practical engagement and how efficient that is compared to the formalized training that we might engage in to build capability. That in fact, getting on the, in the field in, in the real world with our stakeholders and, and actually um, getting our hands dirty is really, really important. And that actually is led to my final point about that illustrates the efficiency and, and the, the importance of, of, uh, of uh, learning by doing, which is Irene's example of her mother milking the cow. You can explain how to milk a cow, or you can just do it. Um, and uh, uh, a much quicker and more effective way. But a really rich uh, dialogue uh, and a fantastic group. Um, thank everyone. Thank you very much, Tristan. Well, that sounds like the conversations were fantastic and we certainly hope that they will continue. Um, I've got to share with you a little bit about next steps. Um, first, I'm just gonna quickly try to draw all of this together in just a moment. And what I'm gonna say is that, is that part of what I heard across all of those rooms is that things like inclusivity, strengthening capability, having impact, these are often goals or values that we bring to partnerships. But what I'm hearing across the board is the critical importance of not just pursuing those goals and values using informal practice, which is perhaps often how it's been done in the past, we need to increasingly move to formal processes that allow us to achieve these goals, whether that be formally supporting the glue in partnerships, the brokers, formally supporting the, 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 the levers and the incentives that help all of the people, all of the right, right stakeholders be, to be part of the partnership, uh, whether it's formal processes to build that trust, showing that, that you can be community driven, collectively driven uh, and, and, and set the stage in the right sort of way. Processes to support the learning and the reflecting that, that, that's a critical part of the iteration that we need here to create the kind of change that we're after. To me, the kind of big take home message was how can we start to dig in to what these formal processes look like? To, to, to create really stronger foundations for our partnerships so that our partnerships can help us to take risks. So that we take risks within the partnership where we might need to share power, uh, but doing so collectively helps us take greater risks to create greater benefit for the world. So that's my attempt to draw all those conversations together. And I need to just leave you very quickly with what are the next steps from our perspective. So as a UN Food System Summit Dialogue, we'll be producing a dialogue synthesis and report which goes into the UN processes and stay tuned to your emails. We'll, we'll be interested in definitely sharing that with you. Um, we're also very interested in, in sharing further case studies that come from the work that, that all of us have been doing. Uh, so, so, so stay tuned for a bit more kind of sharing, at least in a one-way sense. We're really keen to keep this dialogue going. So we know that there's not enough time in these sessions to do that. And we're looking at the mechanisms that will allow us to, to sustain more of a two-way interaction with you. So we, we, we trust there'll be ongoing conversation and we're looking at formal mechanisms to support that. 
And the last thing I wanted to alert you to is, is that ACR is also uh, co-leading another dialogue on food loss with Canada's IDRC on the 3rd of June. So if you're interested in, in keeping the conversation going, but in a different, a different dialogue, a slightly different format, you're most welcome to join us there. The link is on the screen, and, and I believe if it hasn't already been posted in the chat, it will be. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for sharing so honestly, so fully. And we really look forward to continuing to engage with you as, as this road to the actual UN Food Systems Summit continues. Thank you so much. Um, Take care. Veronica, on behalf of all of us, can I thank you for your facilitation and also um, Evelina and Julianne and our DFAT colleagues and our ThinkPlace uh, helpers with the technology. Uh, these things don't uh, magically happen uh, by themselves. So thank you very much for, for that. And thank you so much to everyone who joined us. Um, and in particular, the members of our Policy Advisory Council. I see several uh, members tuning in from all over the region and also our, our commissioners and our CGIR colleagues. So, see people from Washington and Copenhagen and all over the place. So um, it's great that uh, sometimes other people get up at odd hours of the day to participate in these meetings and we can do it in the comfort of our own time. So thank you very much, everybody. And uh, please stay in touch. Take care, everyone.